It's my honor today to be here in attendance and hosting this workshop, introduce our presenters for this workshop. will be facilitated by Dr. Megan O'Malley, PhD and licensed psychologist, Francis Marion, licensed clinical social worker, and Jessica Palacio, licensed clinical social worker. Thank you for that warm welcome, Tina. My name is Frances Marion. My pronouns are she and her, and I am a licensed clinical social worker um, coming in today from Tovangar, um, colonially known as Los Angeles. And just to give a visual description, I have a short brown mullet and a striped button down shirt on. And yeah, I've come to this work um, through the lens of my lived experience as a white, queer, Jewish woman. And I've practiced social work in the states of Wisconsin, Washington, uh, Washington DC, the areas, and uh, now in California. And with my background comes experience working in community mental health with children and families. Um, in HIV and AIDS care in medical settings, and then for the last 10 years in school social work. And uh, currently I work supporting schools in bullying prevention, especially as it pertains to supporting LGBT students and students who are picked on based on other identities. Um, so thank you for having me and I'll pass it over to my colleague, Megan, please. Hi, everyone. Glad to see you. Many of you again. I recognize many of the names in the room and welcome to those of you who are new today. My name is Dr. Megan O'Malley. I am, um, as Tina said, I'm a licensed psychologist, licensed educational psychologist, and nationally certified school psychologist. I train school psychologists at Sacramento State University, where I'm an associate professor, and I maintain an active research agenda in the areas of school climate, school mental health promotion, and I do some work with psychoeducational assessment uh, techniques and strategies as well. Very glad to be here. So I'll hand it to Jessica. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Jessica Palacio, and I was raised in Corona, California uh, by two Belizean immigrants. Um, I primarily attribute my knowledge of early childhood, uh, self-harm and suicide prevention to my previous work as a school-based uh, psychiatric social worker, um, as well as my experience as an intake specialist, a group therapist, a case manager um, at a psychiatric hospital hospital. I have uh, presented at uh, virtual workshops pertaining to social and raci racial justice uh, with Mental Health America. And I am currently a mental health consultant for a large urban school district. Uh, so I currently provide mental health consultation to K through 12 school personnel regarding school protocols and policy that are all pertaining to mental health. And so in addition to providing mental health consultation, I'm also part of a consulting team uh, that supports school communities uh, with crisis counseling following uh, all different types of traumatic events. So for our agenda today, laying the groundwork and thinking about our language around suicidal thoughts and behaviors or STBs, something new we're going to do is we're going to talk about common misunderstandings about suicidal thoughts and behaviors among young children in particular. Then we're gonna discuss ways that we can help caregivers work with their children, talk with their children about death and about suicide in particular. And then we'll talk about when your child is at risk for suicide, how to respond effectively. So we're trying to take the perspective of uh, clinicians, which we know the majority of the audience is clinicians. So how can we as clinicians best support caregivers and parents to support their children. First, it's important that we all use similar language um, so that we understand each other and we have a clear taxonomy for what it is we're referring to. So we have several terms up here. All of them are housed under the umbrella term suicidal thoughts and behaviors. I won't read each of them for time but recognizing that 
we there are suicides, suicidal attempts, suicidal ideation, and then self-harm, which may or may not have a suicidal intent. Critical to the work we do is using, using phrases, being attentive to language that does not reinforce stigma or misunderstandings about suicide and does not use euphemistic phrases. Um, instead, we want to use the phrases death by suicide. We don't want to use the phrase committed suicide. We want to make sure that we're communicating a neutral and non-judgmental stance. And we want to make sure that we're being compassionate towards uh, survivors of suicide. What are some common messages, implied or explicit? That is things that people don't say out loud, but they seem to communicate in their actions and behavior, or things that people really do say out loud that caregivers may have heard about suicidal thoughts and behaviors among elementary age children. So if you could just drop in the chat things that you have overheard, they're too young to think about suicide, they're just looking for attention, yes that suicide doesn't happen in young children, yes, that it's attention seeking, that a young child can't really be suicidal, that it's a figure of their imagination, that if we talk about it, it'll make them think about it, or if we talk about it, it'll cause suicide, that the purpose of the of the suicidal thoughts or behavior is has a manipulative quality or has a manipulative intent to maybe get out of something or to obtain some reward that children are influenced by other children in their environment so many great things here it's hard to even keep up um excellent excellent so this is evidence that you all are deeply engaged in this work because uh, you know that many myths exist and uh, we go over several of these myths in the parent resource that uh, Tina posted a link to earlier in the chat. For now, let's talk about a few of them. So, so these are things that people actually addressed already in the chat. Uh, one is only a small number of children die by suicide, so it really isn't a serious concern. We know that children as young as age four and five can certainly understand death, and although it is rare, young children that age have died by suicide. We know that uh, it it is on the lower end of the leading causes of death for young children, but as children get to age 10, 10 through 12, it becomes the second leading cause of death. And having thoughts of suicide in young children is a in young childhood is a risk factor, of course, for mental health concerns and suicide attempts in adolescence. So children who attempt suicide in childhood are six times more likely to attempt, attempt suicide in adolescence. So it is a serious concern in early childhood, and we need to be very attentive to it. Children, another myth that you all mentioned was children who make comments about suicide are just looking for attention. And other people had variations of this in the chat, like they might just be looking to get out of a task or they might be looking for, um, for, for attention or some other kind of reward. In other words, that the suicidal behavior, the suicidal thoughts or comments is really just a function of attention seeking. So that's uh, certainly not the case. Of course, we know that not all references to suicide are necessarily communicating a wish to die, but each com comment needs to be taken seriously and thoroughly assessed. We need to understand the context for why a child might make a comment referencing a wish to die. And then more specifically, suicidal statements that involve a wish to die or to harm oneself are an indicator of significant pain and distress that require immediate attention. So we, we work within our communities to ensure that any child who makes a comment 
about suicide is attended to and that all comments about suicide are taken um, seriously and assessed for the context of that, of that statement. Third myth, talking to children about suicide or self-harm will put ideas in their heads that they wouldn't otherwise have. Here again is a myth that you all were able to name because you do this work every day. We know that talking about suicide does not cause suicide. Children need a calm, supportive, non-judgmental adult to talk with about psychic pain they might be experiencing. We need to use developmentally appropriate language to, di to discuss self-injury and suicidal thoughts and behaviors. And parents and caregivers have a very important role in the lives of their children to help children understand that no feeling is permanent and that help is available. And I encourage you all to think about um, ways in which your work not only promotes suicide prevention and suicide intervention, but thinks about how do we, how do we dispel these myths for the parents and caregivers that we work with to ensure that we're working with um, fact-based information. What we know is that not all groups of people are at um, experience the same risk of suicide and that disproportionately our Black, Indigenous, um, other BIPOC and LGBT youth are at a disproportionately high risk of suicide. And I'd like you just to read these over and think to yourself, what are some possible reasons for this disparity and think also about parents when you're working with parents and caregivers how how can holding this knowledge in our awareness help us um, understand why these disparities exist that we have a common understanding and a lot of us culturally have different ways of describing death and talking about death and dying and there may be phrases that are um, you know, have to do with our religious beliefs or our, our lack of religious beliefs that we may use. And some of them could be, um, you know, when we say things like, oh, well, he's gone to sleep for a long time. Um, these can be, they can feel more sensitive or uh, more culturally accepted to soften that pain of talking directly about death. And while being sensitive to that, it's also important to recognize that young children may be confused by this language, and we want to make sure that kids, for their own safety, always understand the permanence of death, right? So um, we quote, we cite one resource here at the bottom of this slide that you can look into further in our um, larger paper also gives some examples about how parents can talk about death with their kids. Um, but we do encourage people to, parents and caregivers to gauge their child's understanding at each age about what it means to die because we wanna make sure that they understand the permanence um, and also that they don't become unnecessarily anxious about things like, um, if someone is sick and then they die and then thinking that anytime anybody's sick, they could die, right? Pieces like that. Um, and working with parents and caregivers, you know, if there has been a, a suicide in the family or they're talking about a death of, of someone in their community, it is, of course, okay to let parents know that it's okay to let their kids see their feelings, right? That kids get more anxious and confused when they are being told that something is just fine, but they can tell mom's mom's not fine, right? It's okay to, to be transparent and say mom's grieving. So many of you are, I know are very familiar with what the warning signs are that you might be looking out for um, with students, with children. And it's important to be ex really explicit with explaining these warning signs to parents as well, right? Um, sometimes parents have so much going on that they may have noticed changes in their kids' behavior, but 
until it's brought to their attention that there's maybe been a suicidal comment or a self-interest behavior, then only then are they able to kind of put the pieces together. So um, I encourage schools to, schools and, and other community um serving organizations to have regular workshops with parents so that they can be prepared um, before there's a crisis or before there's a concern about their own child to be able to look for some of these warning signs. Of course, unexplained changes in anything from academic or how kids are engaging at school, um, activities that they used to love and they don't anymore. Um, and then any changes in their behavior that could be like being more uh, more impulsive, um, engaging in risky behavior, like running into the street or climbing to unsafe heights or being in general more careless about um, their own safety, right? Hygiene is an important one to consider. And then with little kids, how this often shows up too is, a lot of somatic complaints that might be vague in nature. So these are the kids that end up, you know, constantly at the nurse's office at school, but they just want maybe that little sad little ice pack that's just a wet paper towel frozen in a plastic bag, if you know the ones, um, or the TLC of the nurse, right? Um, but stomach aches, headaches, just generally not feeling well and sitting out of things can be a warning sign as well. Um, and of course, anytime they communicate to us through um, statements for little kids, it might be things like, I wish I, you know, didn't even have to live this life, or I wish I could um, go be with my grandma, or um, nobody, nobody wants me here anyway, and really taking even those vague comments or general comments really seriously to ask more questions. Um, also, we may notice these themes in kids playing, in their play or in their uh, writing and drawing and, and art. So often teachers will notice in uh, a student's journal or in uh, work that they're doing in class, some reference to death or suicide that we would want to make sure, and, and parents may notice this too, and we want to make sure that they know who they could go to to get more help if, if these um, are noticed. We, we were talking about warning signs around suicide, but it's important to also consider self-injury as it pertains especially to um, you know, a, uh, not every self-injurious behavior is a, an indication that a kid is considering suicide. However, it is an indication that they do not have this, the uh, coping skills that we hope them to have, right, to be able to safely um, manage their feelings. And, and definitely... Um, Sometimes this can be minimized as, well, it's a trend or, you know, gosh, when we all remember when 13 Reasons Why came out, you know, there is an aspect of social contagion, um, especially with uh, self-injury, which is why it's so important that when we are assessing kids, any self-injurious behavior, we're doing so one-on-one -on -one and not in a group that could inadvertently reinforce it. Um, but talking with parents about sometimes uh, young children will use little everyday objects like thumbtacks or paper clips or erasers or um, take out the blade of a pencil sharpener, right? Things that we don't necessarily think that they have access to anything dangerous. And even if it doesn't feel like um, to an adult that it would be very dangerous, the importance is to understand that they're coping by doing something self-interest, right? Whether that's um, a lethal or, you know, means of hurting themselves or not, it's an indication that, that there's a lot of distress and need for support. Um, helping parents also, you know, ask, it's important to ask to ask parents directly and caregivers, have you ever seen your child do any of these things? Because they may not think of pulling out hair or banging their head as self-injurious. Oh, well, they're not cutting, you know, they're not doing that. But 
um, in younger kids or especially in kids um, who have any number of disabilities, uh, this self-interest behavior may look different. We always have to remember it looks different in young kids than in adolescents. So we did, we, uh, we do always in this time of terrifying internet access and social media, right? We also are always having that conversation with parents about supervision. And um, if they were to find any things, sometimes uh, assessments come to our attention because a child has been researching ways to cut or ways to self-injure. Um, and so we want to definitely also make sure that parents know to reach out to a trusted professional if they find that their kid has been researching anything like that. And that we do know that challenges in learning can be a risk factor as well. All right, so um, responding effectively. So what can parents and caregivers do, right? So I think it's for us um, that are, are working with the parents, right? It's so important um, that we remind parents to be mindful of the, or or that we are mindful of the energy that we're bringing to the conversation when we are speaking to parents, actually. So in some cases, the parent could potentially feel like really shocked or really scared or nervous um, upon hearing about some of the warning signs or symptoms that are that the child is experiencing. Or on the opposite end of the the spectrum, they might not even um, be, they might not even be hearing this information for the first time, right? And rather, maybe sometimes they're just simply annoyed, like they don't even want to hear what you're saying. Um, they might feel themselves, they might be feeling defeated, or they're just unamused by your phone call, they want to rush you off of the phone. So a lot of times we see some, well, not a lot of times, but maybe sometimes we do see that parents are dismissive, or they'll even become defensive. Um, so it is normal for parents and caregivers to have automatic fight or flight response, um, especially if they feel frightened for the safety of their child. Um, a parent or caregiver may display anger or become withdrawn, but neither is very helpful at all to the situation. And um, we can remind caregivers that it is important um, their child doesn't feel like they're in trouble. This is a really, really big one. Um, we never want it to be that a child doesn't want to share because they are afraid of getting in trouble. Um, so we can encourage parents and caregivers not to punish their child for expressing suicidal threats or behaviors. We can remind parents and caregivers um, to do a few things when they are having these uh, brave conversations uh, with their children um, or addressing, you know, mental health concerns. Um, so we can encourage them to be attentive and to give their child their full attention. So um, we would remind them uh, not to appear distracted by their phone or any other device, um, because of course the child may not be as willing to share if they know that they're their parent is not even paying attention to what it is that they're sharing and maybe they're like pouring their whole heart out. Um, okay, so we'd also want to listen carefully, right? The parent can listen carefully and stay focused on what's being said um, and trying to listen without, without uh, thinking about what they're going to say next, but rather just simply listening and just really being present uh, for the child. And being curious, um, you want to show, the parent should show curiosity about their child's experience by asking open-ended questions, not yes or no questions, but open-ended questions um, so that they can show that they understand how the child might think, might be thinking or might be feeling. And so some of those questions could be like, uh, what are you feeling? Like very simple questions, right? What are you feeling? Maybe even like, how long have you been feeling this way? Um, what happened to make you feel this way? And I think too, just even remembering that our tone and our facial expressions actually carry a lot of weight. So um, really just being mindful of that as well. When we are asking these questions, you don't want to ask like, well, how long have you been feeling this way? Like, you know what I mean? Like, that's not going to really come off so well to the child. So you really want to like have a soft, like gentle tone as you're talking to the child. And then, um, of course, affirming and validating the child's thoughts and feelings um, and avoiding 
uh, avoiding challenging their recollections or perceptions of events. So you don't want to say like, no, that didn't happen. So you can't possibly feel that way, right? You don't want to, you don't want to do that. You really just want to listen um, and simply validate their experience because they'll likely continue to share, right? And so you'll get a little bit more information as you're validating and hearing them out rather than trying to tell them that whatever they're feeling is, is just didn't happen or it's not valid. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so we must respond effectively. Um, so let's see. So what can parents and caregivers do when they notice warning signs, right? So we talked a lot about warning signs today, um, but what do you do with them? So you want to talk to your child about the concerns and encourage um, we, of course, want to encourage the parent or guardian to be brave and to have empathy, right? Use, um, or just be empathetic. And then also to be direct in asking your child if they're having thoughts um, of hurting or killing themselves. Um, this shows the child that you acknowledge and that you care about their distress and that it is actually okay for them to talk about it. We want to remind parents um, to use developmentally appropriate and matter of fact language um, and ask direct non-ambiguous questions. So I would also like to note here that asking a child if they want to hurt themselves is not like it's completely different than asking a child if they want to kill themselves. So we want to be really mindful of which words we're using because that's going to determine what response we're receiving. Um, Hurting our, wanting to hurt ourselves and wanting to kill ourselves are two different things. So we just want to make sure we're asking the most appropriate question for the scenario. Um, so some examples, um, in addition to those questions, um, you might say, you might add in a, a couple statements, right? We want to be developmentally a, appropriate. So in this case, we're talking about working with elementary age students. You might um, the parent might approach their child and say, I know you've been really sad. Um, sometimes when people are like feeling super sad, they might have thoughts of hurting themselves. Have you ever thought of hurting yourself? It could be as simple as that. Um, or uh, are you having thoughts of hurting or killing yourself right now? Um, and I know for so many people, like at, at least for sure in the school system, they that are maybe non-mental health professionals that are asked to conduct assessments and things like that, asking a child if they want to kill themselves is like a very terrifying question, even for the adult. And so I think it's important that we remember that as well, that we, as we are working with the children, but we're also working with the parents, that there might be some feelings that come up for ourselves as well. Um, but then there's some other questions such as, uh, do you know how you're going to hurt yourself or do you know how you're going to kill yourself? Uh, lastly, you could also ask them um, or state, you must have been feeling really bad to, to have those thoughts. Um, I'm so glad you're telling me about it. How can I keep you safe? So again, just really using um, that validating language and, um, you know, you want to come off as understanding as possible. What do we need to do as clinicians um, in order to be prepared to respond when a parent or caregiver either reaches out to us for help or needs help and hasn't reached out? So first, of course, be prepared to share resources when it comes time for them to be needed. This is, it's valuable to print out the copies of the Our Young Children and Suicide Prevention, a resource for parents and caregivers that has been placed in the chat. We also have a one page, maybe one to two page after formatted um, version of that that'll be coming out soon. So be on the lookout for that. It'd be, I always, when I was a school psych, I would have loved to have something like this that I could send home with a parent uh, after having done a risk assessment with their child. And that provides, within that is a lot of the information that we've been sharing today, but organized to a parent or a caregiver as the audience and the person reading the document. Uh, second, you'll always, of course, want to build relationships with those community-based agencies and maintaining an up-to-list 
up to date list of referrals so that when you need to respond, you're ready to respond and you're not having to lose time uh, making phone calls and sorting out who, where the appropriate agency is. So especially if you work with young, young children, uh, the, the service providers tend to be quite specialized for working with young children. So it's important to have that information prior to a crisis occurring. Second, engage those caregivers by providing regular workshops on health and wellness. Why? Because this way they know who you are before they need you. One thing we know is that there's a lot of stigma around mental health and seeking mental health care. And what I have found is that when I am visible uh, in, in settings where we're talking about more general health and well-being related topics, when a mental health need arises, parents, caregivers, students, teachers are all a little bit more willing to approach me when they know me from another context. So we encourage you to think about ways to provide workshops, to be visible, to make yourself known to families so that when some when a crisis occurs, they know that you're the right person to approach. And then third, model your own healthy self-regulation and communication skills. We all know that burnout is real in our field. And so the first thing you can do is model your own self-awareness around are you feeling a fight or flight instinct when it comes to um, experience, you know, if a referral is made to you for a child who's experiencing suicidal thoughts and behaviors and you're asked to do a risk assessment, are you in a good place to be doing that risk assessment? And then if not, uh, you know, there's supports and opportunities and things you need to do to get yourself in a better place to be ready for that. Be respectful. One of the things we talk about in the brief quite a bit is um, special considerations for families who um, have been historically minoritized. Um, so we have special sections for parents and caregivers of LGBTQ youth. We have a special section for um, American Indian, Alaskan Native uh, families, and also for Black and African American families special considerations for all those groups. So um, make sure to take a look at that, but also just a general sense of honoring the fact that parents and caregivers maintain special knowledge of uh, their children and um, taking a respectful stance will get you, will take you a long way with families. In the brief, we offer hyperlinks to a variety of resources to support families. Um, all families, and then specific resources for um, for Black youth, uh, African American youth, LGBT youth, and um, American Indian, uh, Native American, and Alaskan Native youth. So Embrace Race is um, a great resource that has a number of children's books and supportive resources for working with race, racial identity, and cultural heritage. And this is so helpful for parents and caregivers to have access to these children's books because it provides language and it provides a bridge to have a conversation with a child. Um, Common Sense Media catalogs movies and TV shows that are really supportive of identity development. So those, again, that's a great place to have um, parents and caregivers working with their own children to bolster those protective factors around affirmed positive identity. Sounded Out Together provides resources for caregivers to start conversations with their children about racism, xenophobia, gender, and sexuality. Some of the topics that result in um, bias-based bullying on school campuses and that uh, parents often are struggle with finding the right 
entry place and the most developmentally appropriate entry place for those conversations. Black Girls Smile uh, has culturally responsive resources for supporting the mental health and well being of Black girls specifically. And then PFLAG is one of the oldest uh, organizations for supporting LGBTQ youth, particularly um, providing a lot of resources and workshops and um, groups for parents and caregivers who are seeking to support their LGBTQ children. And once again, um, as Franny mentioned, the um, disparate rates of suicidal thoughts and behaviors for LGBT youth. We've gone over kind of various entry points when working with parents and, and caregivers in terms of thinking about preventative workshops and relationship building um, so that they can be have that suicide prevention awareness. And then we also want to make sure they know exactly what to do if they were to recognize a warning sign um, in their child or learn that their child's had some suicidal ideation or behaviors. So kind of can be um, Megan referenced having something to be able to, to give to parents, and we do hope our resource will be helpful to give to parents, um, but making sure that there's something that we can give parents of what to do in case of an emergency, um, and it could be part of a safety plan, but hopefully they have that knowledge ahead of time before they might need it. And, and that could be um, this slide can be thought of as kind of three steps, supervise, secure, and seek help. So first, of course, encouraging them to, to not leave their child alone if their child has um, expressed uh, suicidal ideation or done something to hurt themselves already. We want to make sure that they're supervised and not also punished um, in a way that could isolate them, such as sending them to their room. Um, Making sure to talk with parents about how to make the environment safer, even if um, even if the child's suicidal ideation is maybe not con directly connected to some of the risks in the home, we really want to make sure parents understand that the the rates of suicide are just much higher in homes that have guns. And so that's even if the child hasn't mentioned anything about a gun, we want to be asking parents and caregivers if there's a gun in the home and then encouraging them to remove the gun from the home for the, while this crisis is happening with their kid. Um, and that can be a hard conversation. Sometimes they don't want to answer it directly and you can say, okay, you know, that's all right. I'm not trying to you know, pry. It's not about getting you in trouble or anything. It's about making sure you understand that this is what we really clearly know about the connection between kids who live in homes with guns and suicides. Um, same with thinking about things like sharp objects, knives, medications should be secured. And sometimes that can feel uh, in my experience, parents think that's a little dramatic, but we want to encourage them to really be better safe than sorry, right? A lot of suicide in, and suicide attempts are um, have to do with impulses and any kind of barrier that's between an impulse and a lethal means or a harmful object is important and life-saving. Um, and then, of course, that your that your families know who to go to, right? So um, it might be different depending on the school. Maybe the school has a really clear suicide prevention and response policy, and you want to make sure they go straight to school and tell the school psychologist or the school school social worker. Um, for other communities, it might be that they need to tell their pediatrician and we want to encourage them to be really explicit when reaching out to systems to say and my kid is talking about suicide or they're talking about they are self-injuring right we know the wait lists are ridiculous pretty much everywhere right now there's not enough um services for all the kids who need it so we want to make sure that parents are being very clear when they're seeking help about the safety concern. Um, going to an emergency room or a lot of therapists, we might have call 911 or go to your nearest emergency room on our voicemail, right? 
We have to acknowledge the risks that are also inherent in calling 911 for many communities and the, pe the many people who have died uh, when they were reaching out for mental health assistance or their families were, right? So there's a lot of reasons why families may be hesitant to call 911 or to go to an emergency room. And we wanna make sure that um, we are being realistic with caregivers about whatever those concerns might be and utilizing any clinical uh, non-law enforcement options that are available such as um, crisis hotlines or uh, psychiatric mobile response teams in your area. Um, yes, and somebody just said you can role play with a parent how they might call 988, the new kind of centralized uh, mental health crisis uh, number. And I think that planning ahead of time with them about how to call is a really, really useful idea. Okay, and again, any youth serving, I mean, this is my opinion, any youth serving organization should have a list of referrals ready for parents, whether that's like a, a community center or a mental health center or a school. And thinking through what is it specific to your region that your families might need? Is it making sure you have resources in different languages? Is it making sure that you understand what the um, transportation options might look like? If the family has public insurance versus private versus uninsured, right? And just be ready with um, helping parents kind of both do a warm handoff for the parents. So I always update my referral list at least once a year, probably more like two or three times a year to make sure I know what the wait lists are like and what their intake process is currently like since many of these things are often shifting. So I'm going to read a vignette. Um, I'm going to advance the well, I'm going to read the vignette, and then I'm going to advance the slide to show you some questions, some reflection questions. When I advance the slide, we're going to put you into small groups. If you were here on Tuesday, you experienced that. We're going to do it again. For your opportunity to talk with each other and share your own knowledge and wisdom with each other around how to respond effectively to a scenario like the one we're sharing here. I'm going to take a moment to read this. <clears throat> Noah is a fourth grade student who is assigned female at birth, but has asserted he, him pronouns. His parent is in the Air Force and the family is new to your school. One day, Noah's teacher sees that Noah has drawn a picture of, on his notebook of a stick figure who appears to be hanging from a noose. The teacher contacts the principal who initiates the suicide prevention and intervention process. The counselor meets with Noah for a risk assessment, determines that Noah actively wishes to die and has a realistic plan for doing so. He plans to hang himself from the top bunk of his bed using a belt. The school team follows the school district policy to contact the city's psychiatric response team. The psychiatric response team determines that he needs further evaluation and transports him to the hospital. The parent arrives at the school after they had already left. The parent angrily states, "Ugh, Noah, she just wants attention. She does this all the time. You should have called me first. The hospital determines that for his own safety, Noah will be retained on a 72 hour hold, only after which the parent can see him. What are the possible risk and protective factors for Noah? What was effective about how the school managed this and how could it, how could the school response be improved? What would be a successful approach for talking with Noah's parent? And what would you advise Noah's caregiver to do to support Noah? Just thinking about kids returns to school. So especially if they have had a, a psychiatric hospitalization, we want to be really mindful about what kind of supports and scaffolding they might need to have a successful re-entry to school. And our resource goes into more detail about some of the accommodations that could be made informally or when a more formal um, accommodations might be warranted. So I'll direct you to the resource for that. 
there's definitely um, we need to have those courageous conversations with parents when we recognize that things that they're doing are putting their child at risk or are harming their child. And we need to really um, go from seeing their strengths and uh, bolster those where we can and um, and encourage. These are just some of the things that we know are protective factors for, for youth and suicide risk. And it's important that parents, in addition to learning about warning signs and risk factors, that they learn what to do, right? Um, and have those concrete skills fostered as well. Because for a lot of us, we may not have had this modeled at home and, uh, you know, offering classes at your center or workshops can be a really good way to, to help build these skills in parents as well. We do wanna thank you of course for being here and uh, we want to make sure that we welcome you to keep in contact with us. And this is, uh, this is how we can connect via email, website, as well as our social media. We also wanna thank our funder, Samson,